I'm Charlotte McLeod with investingnews.com, and here today with me is John Fennick, Portfolio Manager and Consultant at Fennick Consulting. Thank you so much for joining me. Great to have you here. Thanks a lot, Charlotte. Nice to see you again. Of course. And, you know, it hasn't been too long since we last spoke, but there is a lot to catch up on. So I think where we'll begin today is, as we usually do, with gold. And exciting week for gold. We had it up above 2000 at least for a little while this week. So I'm going to start easy on this and ask you, you know, what are the most important factors for gold that you're seeing right now? Well, we talked on your show after the March financial crisis this year that gold had a new floor put in on it, right? Uh, you and I interviewed just before that at VRIC, and we were talking about the 1800 level holding, which was actually correct there. Um, then in March, when we talked, we talked about the financial crisis adding a new floor to gold, and you saw gold take off to almost an all time high, right? Um, and, and so that is very bullish. Um, then you saw that period of time from the spring to the summertime where we had about five months where the gold price never dipped below 1900 in consecutive days, which I gets lost on a lot of investors. I think that's never happened before in history. So there's a lot of interesting price action that's happened this year, Charlotte. Um, and now since we last interviewed, I think our interview uh, last time was around October 1st and we had October 7th with what happened in Israel, right? So like that's another floor now on gold with a lot of other investors coming in and saying, wow, I never knew that was even on the table, right? I never knew that international relations were in this poor in certain parts of the world. And so, you know, it's, I think the gold setup here is beautiful. And you and I have been talking like this for about two and a half, three years now. And I've been very guarded on the price of gold. You know, I've never talked new highs ever. I've never said 2,500 this or 5,000 that. We are saying, you know, as a result of what happened now, October 7th, that you are going to see a new all-time high in gold next year, which is new for us because we've been pretty pragmatic on the price of gold, you know, and just saying it's going to take some time. But now, if it wasn't for, you know, Bitcoin doing so well, AI doing so well, tech doing so well in general, you'd, you'd have an all-time high probably already in our view, but it'll just happen next year. That's that's fine with us. We get more time to build positions. And so we don't buy that. Uh I think, you know, the, the setup looks beautiful if you look at a long-term chart of gold over 15 or 20 years. Yeah, you know, there's there's a lot of distractions out there for people, but it does look like things are going to come back around to gold sooner or later. And I'm glad that you brought up the, the war that's going on right now because that's kind of interesting to me too because typically you see when there's a conflict like that, maybe it gives that short-term boost to the price and then people forget about it. But it seems like now, now is that having kind of a greater effect because there's so many other things that are on gold's side at the moment? Yeah, I mean, the geopolitical piece for us is important. And so that just added to the reason why you should own physical gold and or gold-related investments. Um, as I've said on your show before, you know, for gold to go from 1900 to 2000 is great, um, like it just did, right? But that's a 5% move. We're not interested in 5% moves in what we do. We're interested in, in outsized gains in gold stocks that will have leverage to a move in the price of gold, right? So there's many that we've talked about on your show before, but, um, you know, for us right now, I mean... She's uh, just real quick. I mean, Cartier had a, a really good news piece this week, uh, ECRFF, which we've mentioned on your show at least twice. Um, what I like, since we last talked, Charlie, we should bring this up. Marathon Gold and, and Caliber did a deal, right? Um, you know, Mar the Marathon Gold deal, if you were, I owned a very small piece of Marathon, but, you know, if you're a Marathon bigger shareholder, you probably weren't happy with that deal. And so we're looking for, gold companies, silver companies, nickel companies, et cetera, that are not looking to sell right now. We're really, really not interested in the takeover kind of thing because these prices are ridiculous. I don't want to see a 30% premium on a ridiculous price. I want to see, you know, uh, the ability for a leader to lead through this time and get to the other side. And this isn't a knock on marathon. I don't know the inner workings there. I'm just saying that Philippe, at, at, at Cartier wants to get to the other side and I, he has a plan to get there. When you look at his insider ownership, it's heavy. Um, he's got a group of investors that own about eight to 10% that are just high net worth. He has Agnico, which owns 15 and a half percent. He's got O3 mining, which owns about 15%. So when you add just that up, it's about 40% of the entire float, right? So that just to ed educate your, your listeners 
is going to block a hostile takeover, right? Because they're not going to sell for what the price is now. And they're not going to sell for a 25% premium either, I don't think. So that's interesting for us. We want to build in, in names like that, that have a plan, have you know some, some, some people on their side that see that this gold price is going to break out soon. And we're not going to sell for, for a lower price, right? And I think that's important to know. Yeah, I think that is, that's an important distinction and it's good to go through the examples so that people know exactly what you're talking about. I think we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about companies as we keep going. I do also want to bring up, so before we turn the camera on, we're talking about the latest CPI data and the effect that that's had on sentiment in the market. So I wanted to ask you to expand those thoughts and tell me what you see going on there. Yeah, so we were saying on your show last year that CPI was running real hot, and we have said multiple times on your show and others that the Fed means business, and until we get close to a 2% mandate, they are not going to back down. And now, you know, at the 3% level, they're getting very close, right? So, like, that to us was meaningful on November 14th, where the CPI read came in 0.1% lower than expected, but at the same time, it's lower, right? And that trend the previous month was up. So, I mean, seeing a drop like this, the market loved it. And not just gold and silver, it was the broad market that really loved it. So I think November 14th changed some things for us because right after that, the Fed Futures uh, meeting, like the CME, uh, uh, you, you know, a website that I've given your listeners before, um, it basically just said that the 20 to 25% probability of a 25 basis point hike in December and January, both almost immediately went to like five to 7%. So you're seeing a very low chance of a hike now in December, very low chance in January. And then in March, what's interesting to me is that now there's a 30% chance of a cut. So you have a 30% chance of a 25 basis point cut on March 13th or whatever the day that falls on. And that's really bullish because if you remember the last time we interviewed, only 12, well, excuse me, all of the 19 people on the Fed had said no cuts in 2023. That's not wonderful if you're a gold and silver investor because you want that, you know, uh, acquiesce move from the Fed and we're not getting, we're, we're seeing, you know, them be consistently guarded and hawkish most of the year. So now the tables may be turned as early as March, I'd say easily by Q2. And we're trying to invest ahead of that because when that comes, you're going to get another flow of money, I think, into the mining stocks. Okay, interesting, interesting. And okay, I have a point that I want to ask you about when it comes to inflation. So what I what I have heard at times in the past is, you know, it's coming back down, it's coming back down, but it's that last little chunk before you get back to 2% that might be the hardest. So what are your thoughts on that? How do you think that plays out? That is a great question. I mean, I don't know. I think it's sort of like you have to follow the tape and the tape right now is telling you that we're going to see a significant pause if nothing else, right? And that is difference. And that's what is getting us more excited about what we're seeing in our sector because if you look at GDX, for example, it went from like the 26 range all the way to 29 plus today. And that's a really nice move since the November, you know, news that we're discussing. So, you know, we need to see GDX break 30 um, with some authority. And then it's going to have some resistance at 32 or 33. But I mean, getting through 30, um, I think by the end of the year, we'll get investors much more interested as we enter next year. Um, but going back to your point, I mean, I, I think uh, that last 1% is going to be extremely difficult uh, to get to 2%. As I've said on your show before, whether it's 2, 3, 5, it doesn't matter. All of this feels like, you know, 15 to 20% inflation. Uh, we were just talking off camera about how crazy hotel prices were in, in Toronto and some of the places we have to go to uh, at these conferences. And, and that's not changing. It's getting worse. So, I mean, if you're traveling out there, you really feel it. I just came off a 13 day road show and the prices paid were absolutely astronomical. Um, and I'm not staying in really fancy places. It's, it's just, this is where we are, right? There's, there's a, um, for lack of a better term, a narrowing of the middle class. Uh, it's it's like either you have the money to go do stuff or you don't, and it's getting worse, and that's really unfortunate. 
Yeah, yeah. It does feel bad looking at those travel prices. I haven't yet checked my my credit card statement from when I was just traveling in the U.S. And I know the exchange rate is also going to hurt with our poor Canadian dollar. Uh, anyways, you know, one of our other topics that we have focused on before is we've talked about recession. And I think in our last talk, you mentioned we're setting up for a recession into 2024. Meanwhile, though, we do have people who are still looking at the Fed's progress and thinking maybe we get that soft landing. So, of course, want to check in with you there. Yeah, I mean, look, the data that we saw from CPI November 14th supports more of a soft landing kind of scenario. But when you look at Powell's comments just 13 days before that on the Fed day, November 1st, he was basically saying we're going to have a soft landing, which was new for his kind of rhetoric, right? I mean, I, I mean, that's, that's going all in, in my opinion, that's, that's like really going out of the limb. And what happens if you're wrong? What happens if there's some unforeseen events, like we were just talking about geopolitically that we can't control, we can't foresee, well, then they're going to have to walk that back. And, and that's why we remain uh, pretty confident that what we'll see a recession by, you know, we've been saying by, by June ish of next year, we, we, changed our forecast, as you know, back in May of this year when I saw tech and AI just take off and uh, other factors were, were, you know, the real estate market was was less affected than I was expecting. Um, although I will say, like, if you look at the 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 short in the real estate ETF world, which is REK, that's what, what, what we use, it's a beautiful looking chart. It has pulled back, but we've made a lot of money shorting real estate since January of 2022. So, you know, we did cover some of that uh, around November 14th because TLT, the 20-year the bond, started to move up. And that's going to be something you look for as an indicator to cover shorts that are interest rate sensitive. But it's, it look, I mean, we can make money in this market, I think, going forward into next year, Charlotte, in the mining sector, in the energy sector, on the long short side. I mean, there's a lot of opportunities as we enter next year. So, you know, sitting here right now, I feel really good about what we own. Good, good. And I think we can shift back over to looking at companies right now. So we always make sure to check in with you on the stocks you're watching. And where I thought we could begin is with uranium, because that's also very hot right now. Uranium above $80 per pound this week. So what are you seeing there? Well, one interesting dynamic that Sprott pointed out in their white paper last week was that the uranium price is actually up more this year as a commodity than the average equity. The average equity is up like 35% or so, and then the price of uranium is up over 55%. So that, something's got to change there, right? I mean, like the price of a commodity generally is never above uh, the price of equities because equities have a lot more risks to them, generally speaking, right? So... I think there is going to be some catch up on the, I don't necessarily think uranium is going to fall. I think that uh, the equities are playing catch up right now. And if you look at the sector, look at what Fission did. They, they you know, did a really nice raise a number of weeks ago. Uh, uranium royalty, I just presented with Scott Melby in, in Zurich. Uh, he sat right next to me and had some interesting things to say about the sector's growth into next year. Um, Uroy did a really nice raise and then... Uh, uh, the stocks bounced right back, right? Uh, Denison, same thing. DNN. I mean, they basically did a you know, very large raise and, and are now higher than the raise price. Um, so that's all really bullish when you look at the sector. Um, we still own Denison. We still own some Uroy. We own uh, uh, URA, which is the uh, the biggest equity ETF out there. It's a nice way to play the sector in a general way. But we also own a lot of forum, which we've mentioned on your show before. Um, I think I mentioned that in August at four to four and a half cents. And I may have even said it was an insane price. And I rarely go out on a limb like that. But it was insane because it, then they had a discovery in September. And the stock went from four cents to 15 cents. So that's the potential that you have in the uranium space right now is that there is tremendous upside in some of these smaller names because they have been so beat down. When you look at a three-year chart of forum, the, the forty uh, the three year high was forty seven, the low was right when we interviewed at four cents. So you know how is something down ninety plus percent when it's run by someone like Rick Mazur who's been in the business four years? It doesn't make any sense. So that's one of the things that we do well, Charlotte, is we keep in touch with Rick on a monthly basis. 
We keep in touch with most of our juniors like Philippe and Cartier on a monthly basis. I want to get updates on good and bad. I don't want the good news only. I want to hear, you know, hey, what happened with those drill results that you didn't like? You know, was that exactly what you expected? If not, tell me a little bit more about that and get some color around that. Yeah, I think that's that gives some insight into your process there. Definitely really helpful. And okay, so let's let's keep talking about the stocks that you have on your radar right now. I was going to I was going to ask you if you have one that you are most excited about in 2024. That might be a bit of an unfair question. There might be more than one. So I'll I'll put it out there for you. You, you and I should probably talk about that in January. I usually do those kind of conversations in January to say, hey, here's our like, you know, five. But I'm happy to answer that. It's a valid question. Um, you know, when I look at um, the entire landscape out there, there's so many values. Um, I mean, if you're looking just for 2024, gosh, um, I have to say that I think some of these gold juniors are just absolutely crushed and gold will make a new high next year. So I've already mentioned Cartier. Um, you know, again, as long as something like that doesn't sell, you know, at a 30% premium, then I think the upside is, is, is very strong and something like that. I honestly think like USAU, um, at 324 here right now, um, they're going to get their permits. I really strongly believe that in Wyoming, and that could happen as early as March, maybe April of next year. So that being a NASDAQ stock with a very low float, I mean, I'm talking like 10 million shares. Um, again, they have the ability to block a takeover because I own some shares. The former CEO owns shares. The chairman owns shares. The current CEO owns shares. They have funds in Switzerland that own shares. None of these entities that I just named are selling at 324. We're not going to sell at four bucks. We're not going to sell at 450. We're not interested in a small gate. We're interested in a larger gate. And, and once you cross that $5 mark, Charlotte, in the, uh, being in a U.S. ticker, that brings in a whole other wave of buy. If you look at the chart, you'll see that over the course of a three- or five-year look. Every time that thing goes above 5 bucks, it just starts to move because brokers at Merrill Lynch, brokers at Morgan Stanley, brokers at Wells Fargo, they can all buy that stock now, generally speaking. Um, that brings in a whole other you know, group of buyers into a stock that has very low you know, public float. Okay. Okay. Thanks for, sorry to limit you with the question. If you had any others that you wanted to mention, please go ahead. Well, we mentioned Tellarium on, on the last one, and I know that's sort of uh, an outlier for many listeners. Yeah. It's something, again, I, I really had no uh, following on, on Tellarium up until about a year and a half ago. I started to talk to Ty. Uh, I was referred to him and, uh, you know, Ty has he works very hard, and and I like that in a CEO. It's 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 easy to fold your hand in this market, and and Ty's not that type of individual. Um, the stock, you know, has a, a big seller out there. Let's be honest. The last time I mentioned it on your show was around just under seven cents, and now it's at five and a half. So we're down from where we mentioned it. But you know, we bought more today. Um, we'll continue to buy on weakness here between now and the end of the year, because I think that. I'm very interested in the trend, Charlotte, and that trend is commodities that are heavily produced in China, because I think over the next two years, who is to say when this is going to happen? But if there is a China-Taiwan conflict, China is going to pull the rug and not deliver some of these metals, in my opinion. Um, And I'm not the only one who feels this way. There's a lot of smarter people than me that are talking about this, some of which, like Chen Lin, that are Chinese and has a better read on this than I do. Um, And so... Chen Lin interviewed uh, Ty Doherty in July. If you go to YouTube and check it out, it's a pretty good interview. And he brought that point up because he's like a big solar panel guy and tellurium is a component in every solar panel, right? So without getting too myopic, it's it's something where it's, it's, it's a really interesting play at these prices because you can't replace that, right? It's, it's on the critical mineral list. Um, another one that comes to mind that's a new name for us is uh, Power... Uh, sorry, golden metal resources. And uh, that one I just met with the CEO, Oliver, in London here a couple of days ago for about two hours. And we went through the story. You know, they are a heavy tungsten junior play. But what's interesting is that they're in Nevada. And tungsten is a major, again, major produced in China, over 80% of the world's tungsten produced there. Um, there's going to be some U.S., 
if you don't believe me, take a look at Talon Metals, right? Talon in November just had news about, um, I think it was a large U.S. government agency. I don't own the stock, but had, had come you know to a to an understanding with them that they were going to partner, and that's really positive news in the commodity space when you see that kind of action. Um, it may not you know mean immediate price appreciation in the stock, but it's it's showing you that the U.S does understand that there's going to be problems and supply demand imbalance is going forward. And I think tungsten is just flying under the radar here because it's used in a lot of uh, defense type strategies. You know, over 10% of the world's tungsten that's produced is used just for defense. So um, it, it got me interested because of the jurisdiction and because Oliver is a sharp guy and um, it's something that we're taking a look at. Um, lastly, uh, Power and Nickel is a newer name for us, uh, kind of following along in the lines of Talon. Um, that is an interesting. These Nickel Juniors look absolutely outstanding right now. I mean, they're they're so beaten up that something's got to give here. I mean, Nickel's a real commodity. Um, it works in 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 our view uh, in 2024 and 2025 because you could have some disruptions if you look at Indonesia being the largest um, you know producer of nickel globally. They have a regime change coming February 2024. Now, the guy that's been in power has been there since, I believe, October of 14. So someone who's been in power almost 10 years is out the door. He has been very supportive of nickel. What happens if you get a regime change and that's not the case? You have a supply-demand imbalance, and I think that's going to be you know headlight news. So power and nickel, we really like. Um, they've, they've done some really good things here over the last month in terms of news flow. Um, They've raised cash from two different entities uh, over the last, you know, since Beaver Creek. So what, do you, what is that, two months? Um, and the ticker on that is PNPN uh, in Canada, PNPNS in the States. Beautiful looking chart uh, for a nickel junior because it's just kind of bouncing, you know, range bound now and probably will move higher into next year. Okay, thanks for going over those. I think definitely critical metals close to home really makes sense as a theme for people to be looking at. The other point that I wanted to mention just before we're wrapping up here is in our previous interview, I think you you mentioned just briefly tax loss selling. And we're coming up to that season. And I know that people have a lot of questions about that. I've seen comments asking, how do people do this strategy? One of our most popular articles on the site is about tax loss selling. So Thoughts on how people can approach that? Absolutely. Um, I am different than most of my peers in that many will say, well, hey, it's different this year because we saw so much selling in July and August, we're not going to get it in, in November, December. That's completely wrong. Uh, because I look at the screen 60 hours a week, right, when I'm not traveling. And I'm telling you, there are huge sellers out there right now and a lot of the names we track or own. And think about it this way for your listeners. If you were in on the IPO of that stock or helped finance them in a very low round, right? Meaning like two, three, four years ago. Let's say your company as a hedge fund or private equity firm is in trouble. Well, you're selling everything. You have to sell, right? That's forced liquidation. It's just happening. So like you have a date you want to sell by generally. And usually that's going to be your end, right? And so these, these companies uh, will not sometimes work with the company, meaning the mining stock CEO, and let them know they're doing this. They're just going to sell, right? And then it causes huge price disruption. Um, I saw that on Thunder Mountain Gold today, THMG. We've been out there for two weeks on the bid at a very low price and got filled. Why? Because someone took it from five cents down to 0.037 in one trade, 144,000 shares, I think it was. And so we're just out there 20% away, and somehow we got filled. Um, it's just that time of year. So I coach my followers and my clients Put one order, buy the bid and ask. So if it's you want to get filled by five, be out there at you know five or a little lower, but then have something twenty percent away, fifteen percent away, ten percent away, somewhere in there. That's going to be your dream fill, and and maybe you get lucky. And that's how we've made money in this in this sector, Charlotte. We don't jump at things. We don't chase anything. Uh, we're very patient value investors, and. That's something I think I could help some of your listeners with as we enter next year. Um, you know, being patient is really important in mining. It's easy to chase, but it's it's not a great strategy unless you're in a 2020, you know, where you're coming out of a V-shaped type recovery and you know you've got wind at your back. 
right now it's very suspect, right? It's more of a rifle approach to the market. So we'd love to, you know, hear from some of your listeners and see what we can do to help. Um, I probably, when gold breaks to you, hi, I'm not going to be as available. <laughs> we're uh, we're going to be there next year. Very true. Very true. All right. So just as we're finishing up, if you had any final thoughts, I think this will probably be our last conversation until January when we see each other at BRIC. So any, any last thoughts? I would just tell people to hang in there. And if you don't need to do a tax loss sale, don't do it. I mean, I think in our sector right now, in gold and silver in particular, we got more interested in gold and silver stocks as a result of what happened October 7th. And silver has been very frustrating because it has over the last you know two calendar years traded more like an industrial metal but what happens if it starts trading more like a precious metal next year or the year after i think that's very possible and so we want to buy stuff that is completely thrown out of the window here because we do think that silver is moving higher we're trading at 2350 an ounce silver right now gold's just under 2000 when you divide that gold ounce of 2000 let's call it by 2350, you come up with about an 85 gold silver ratio as we sit here right now. Every time you get close to 90, going back to the 1980s, silver looks pretty attractive as an investment. So we're not buying silver right now, we're buying silver equities. Uh, we've talked about a few on your show before, but you know, names that either have news, like Silver Tiger just came out with some news on their PEA, looked really good. They've got seven analysts as a junior stock, right? So like, what happens in a good silver market to that stock? Well, it's not going to be at 11 and a half cents anymore because you've got seven powerful analysts that are going to start writing up a stock like that. Most juniors have one analyst, maybe two, right? Uh, maybe not. So it's, it's a really interesting story. Um, we're looking for names like that right now that we can kind of sift through the rubble and pick and, you know, hold on to a better time. Okay. All right. Well, we'll be looking forward, hopefully, to those better times in 2024. I think we'll leave it there for now. This is really great. Thank you for coming on to talk about what's going on in the markets. My pleasure and happy holidays to everyone. Of course. And once again, I'm Charlotte McLeod with investingnews.com. And this is John Fennick with Fennick Consulting. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, make sure you subscribe to our channel. We'd also love to hear your thoughts, so leave us a comment below. We'll see you next time.